Good evening and welcome to Watchman on the Wall. Thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight we are at UWC with my co-presenter, Michelle Lings. Good evening. Uh, and we are, I'm speaking at the uh, Form and Publication Board talk and, and the question or the topic tonight is, is content on television currently appropriate for children? And to that we must say a resounding no. no. And as a mother, uh, Michelle has joined me here because we want to talk about this issue. Uh, this is a tussle between free speech, the right of adults to view whatever they want to, and the right to protect children, the dignity and the safety of children and women, as a matter of fact. But uh, my research into this uh, issue tells me that what is currently on South African tele television is extremely harmful to children. You've got pornography on free-to-air television channels like ETV. You've got pornography on SABC. You have Top TV, who now has applied for the second time for three 24-hour hardcore pornographic channels. And then you've got all the other things on DSTV. Yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, South Africa is really in a bad situation when it comes to the health emotional and psychological have welfare of children. You agree with that, uh, Michelle? Oh, yes, definitely, Errol. Even the sub -op operas that seem as normal and innocent, you know, most of the intimacy or sexual intimacy they have is outside of marriage. And what does that promote? It's saying to the child out there, it's okay to have married, uh, to have sex at a young age. Before marriage? And Before marriage, yes. And that's alarming, which means teenage pregnancy, which means abortion. And it's devastating. I think that is the reason we see so much teen pregnancies, that we yes. see so many young people going multiple times to abortion clinics yes. for abortions. And, mm. that's, and that is the, kind of the, the effect and the impact it's having on our children. Um, currently, the Form and Publication Board, who is hosting this event, uh, do not regulate what is on television. Yeah. And I've been speaking to Yulise Wormakazi, who is going to be speaking later in this event, about the Film and Publication Board actually regulating television content. Yeah. And I think because they are not, we're seeing what we see on television today. Mm -hmm. The other thing is the media were very clever, cleverly um, uh, made a, 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 a move to self-regulate themselves, mm -hmm. uh, especially what they put on television. So they've got this imaginary timeline okay. called the watershed mm -hmm. at 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. where they argue that at 9 a.m. or after 9 p, uh, p.m., not 9 a.m., sorry, 9 p.m., after 9 p.m., every child in this country is fast asleep. And so, therefore, they cannot be exposed to anything harmful yeah. or bad on television. Now, we know mm. that in South Africa, the two-parent family, if you didn't know this, the yeah. two-parent family in South mm. Africa is the minority. Yes. And single-parent families and, and, and families without both parents present, child-headed homes, yes. is the majority in South Africa. So the question is, who's supervising them? Yeah, that's When you true. put pornogra pornography on television, mm. when you put violence, gratuitous violence on television, yes. Who's supervising those children? Yeah, and Errol, there's lots of single parents, like you are right. Even in our church, there's so many single parents, and these moms struggle. So I know personally my child does not go to sleep that early, and constantly we need to change channels, and it says PG-13 or parental guidance. It says it's okay, but when you view the movies and when you view even the ads, you know, it's, it's horrendous. It's, I want to protect my child, so I would switch the television off. Talking about ads, ETV has got this porn SMS ad uh, thing where um, they're selling uh, hardcore pornographic images to anybody that oh, would yes. send an SMS mm. to a certain number. And children, all children now have a cell yeah. phone and they sending these uh, 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 messages and getting these hardcore pornographic images to their cell phones. Mm. And what has happened as a result of them receiving these, these are 8-year-old eight children, 10-year-old, mm. 11-year-olds, been exposed to these hardcore images, they are now making their own sex videos, children. Oh gosh. And they're recording that on their cell phones and they're sharing those images mm. with them, with each other. Mm. This is what is called sexting. Oh, no. Sexting has become a phenomenon in, in, in not only here in the Western Cape, mm. but all over the country. Mm. And so what we're doing is we are traumatizing our children. Uh, and later on when I speak, one of the things I'm going to say is that we're raising up a generation of sexual deviants because we're exposing them to sexual 
uh, activity, human relationships, that is not normal. Yes. That is not natural. Yeah. And with these children being bombarded with these images, uh, what is going to happen? They are going to grow up to disrespect women, mm. to view women as sex objects, to become rapists mm. and abusers. Uh, I don't say all of them will, but but the research is showing that when young boys are exposed to these kind of images, that they their view and understanding of women is warped and perverted forever. Yes, and you find that in schools as well. You find cases in schools where you find that boys are now touching girls in inappropriate manners, and even boys with boys. And where do they see it? You know, on television, on their cell phones, like you said. Every child out there in South Africa has got a cell phone. It's easy accessible to porn, you know. I think one of the most disturbing cases I've seen recently on television was uh, the report in the media, two children in a school classroom sitting at the back of the classroom, which is in session, having sex. Oh, gosh. And, and a friend videotaping that activity in the classroom. So if we begin to see what is happening in our nation today with our children, and it's getting younger and younger, yes. I think South Africans have got to wake up. Mm. We've got to say enough is enough. This has got to stop. Mm. And, you know, if people rose up in this country and said, we don't want this kind of thing in telev on television any longer because of the harm it's having on children and on women, yeah. because of the way women are portrayed in the media is yes. having a devastating impact yeah. on them. I think people need to rise up yeah. in South Africa. And I believe that parents should be educated. They should speak to their kids openly. They should also become more wise on, on what programs their kids should watch. Because yeah, a lot media of parents, wise families. Yes, a lot of parents are very liberal and allow the kids to watch whatever they want. So the, the kids rule in the home, which parents should take a stand. And I think broadcasters know that. Yeah. That's why they target these children with these kind of images and programming yes. that pushes their agenda and their ideology. Mm. And of course, we're trying to teach our children values, Christian values, biblical values. Yes. And it's all been undone by the media and, and what they're pushing at their agenda on television. Yeah. So if you stay with us and, uh, later in the program, you're going to see the talk, four talks about this issue. Different people, myself, uh, Clive Human of Stop Standing Together to Oppose Pornography, uh, Yaliswa Makazi, the Chief Executive Officer of the Film and Publication Board, and an academic here from the University of Western Cape. So don't go away, more after the break. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be here. I want to firstly thank the Film and Publication Board for ho hosting this uh, important topic. And I'm particularly grateful for uh, the title of the topic, Our Shared Responsibility. And I'm grateful for that because I believe that protecting children from exposure to harmful content on television and the internet is all of our responsibility. Now the media has repeatedly said that uh, the responsibility for protecting children from harmful content lies with the parents. And uh, they're right when they say that. Parents are primarily responsible for their children. but. If you do research in South Africa or you look at research in South Africa, you would find that the two-parent family is now in the minority. That there's about 45% of families have both parents present. The single parent family is the majority in South Africa. And then there are many families, hundreds of thousands of families where there's no parents um, in the home at all. That means we have child-headed families. So the question we have to ask is, who's supervising those children? We, to answer the question, how appropriate is the current content on television for children, my response is an emphatic, not appropriate at all. Now the Film and Publication Act makes it a criminal offense to expose children to, pornogra to pornography. Yet ETV is getting away with it every single day. And broadcasters in South Africa have cleverly and cunningly established an imaginary watershed line called the watershed. At 9 o'clock, they claim, all children in the country go to sleep. Not one single child is awake and exposed to a television. This is a magic thing that the media has come up with. 9 o'clock, bong! All the children go to sleep. <laughs> and they stand by this thing. So they say, at 9 o'clock, and all the children just fall asleep automatically, we can put any rubbish on television that we want. 
We can put hardcore pornography, we can put things that demean and degrade women because it's nine o'clock. And of course, the media itself has exposed that lie because they report children sitting in front of top TV watching hardcore or softcore porn and this has given rise to child on child sexual abuse in South Africa. Ten year old children raping other children. More recently we had a case where two children sitting in the back of a class were having sex while another child recorded that on their cell phones. This is the result and the consequences of children being exposed at an early age to images and ideas and concepts that their young minds cannot handle. So we, we're facing a disaster in this country, that's my personal opinion, in that South Africa currently has statistics that show us over a year 64,000 women are raped in this country. More than 25,000 children are sexually abused, raped in this country every single year. And those figures are not going down. And then there has to be a reason for that. And you see, if you bombard children as young as 8, 9, 10, 11 and 12 with images that portray women as sex objects, they're there for one thing only, for sex. When you keep on bombarding young men and they grow up with that ideas and those concepts, what happens? That thing sinks in, that shapes their minds. And so men are grabbing women and raping them because the media is bombarding them with these images and these ideas all the time. There's no respect for women in South Africa and there's a reason for it. And it's called freedom of expression. Is it really freedom to put anything you want to on television. And when Top TV applied for the second time for three pornographic, hardcore pornographic channels, 24-hour channels, and they're doing this because the business is in trouble, so they see this as a rescue plan, but without giving any thought to what is happening in our nation. And when we spoke to them about the high rates of sexual violence against women and children and their responsibility in this nation, they said, well, that's not our problem. The parents has got to see that children are protected. It's got nothing to do with us. We put the porn on TV, we make the money out of it, and whatever happens to the woman and the children is not our fault. It's not our problem. Is that a good social responsibility strategy? No, it's not. But they want to put that on and they're saying, well, you know, we've got these uh, mechanisms to, to um, pro you know, uh, parental control mechanisms, PIN numbers, all these kind of things. But the research also shows that children are more technology savvy than their parents. Children can get around these technologies easier than their parents can. And we know that more and more children will be exposed to that hardcore pornography than anything in this country. Now we're already grappling with rampant and out of control sexual violence against women and children. And so we've got to weigh up this thing called, called freedom of expression and rights and all of that and the right to protect children from harmful content. I will err on the side of protection of children anytime. In a recent case, I, I, I believe it was the Daria case in the Constitutional Court, not recent, but about 10 years ago, a man was caught, caught in possession of child pornography. He challenged right to the Constitutional Court that his right to privacy was violated because he was, he was um, collecting this child pornography as a research, as research for some movie or something he was doing. Do you know what the court ruled? The court ruled when any two constitutional rights come into conflict, the right of the child is always paramount. Now any right-thinking South African will agree with that. How many of you would agree with that? The right of the child must always be paramount. And that means that when it comes to freedom of expression and freedom of this and freedom of that, we, we, we don't mind giving up a little, a little of our freedoms in order to protect children. Because it's all of our interest to protect children. Children, today's children, today's generation is our, our future leaders. Our future leaders and how they think and how we shape our minds is going to be important to what kind of society we're going to have in future. 
The kind of society we have today is already frightening. The other day they showed men beating up a woman on the floor, then in the media it's this woman being raped, this girl being raped, the teachers are raping the young girls, girls are going to abortion clinics three times in one year to have abortions after abortions after abortions, they're getting younger, teen pregnancies, it, the list just goes on. What is a future South Africa going to look like if this thing continues unabated? We've got to seriously think about these things. It's not a healthy society by any stretch of the imagination. We've got to take some serious decisions as a society in South Africa. Are we going to demand our freedoms to watch whatever we want to on television whenever we want to as adults? The same people that's raping children, the adults? Or are we going to err on the side of caution and do everything in our power to protect our children, to give them a better life? to give them a better future, to have a better society in South Africa in the next generation. The decision lies with us. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. I think I'm being set up to speak after Errol, uh, but uh, I'll deal with Mili for doing that to me. I think that I was told that I'm not uh, part of the speakers, so my job is just very easy, really, to say that as the Film and Publication Board, uh, I'm quite happy to see so many people, particularly young people, particularly young people who are using these uh, media outlets that we're talking about. They watch television, they are on Twitter, they are on Facebook, they have cell phones, they take pictures of their body parts, private and public. They send these pictures to other young people or to older people for whatever reasons that they do so. And I think this debate, this discussion is going to be very useful and very good because you also have to share with us what is your own take. We are old, I mean I'm 38, I'm old, um, and uh, some of the things that I say to young people, they don't even listen to me because they think I'm old-fashioned or I'm conservative. So I think it's very important to hear young people themselves. I think as society there is a huge concern, a concern that relates to uh, the, the, the dangers and the exposure of young people to content that they shouldn't be exposed to. A, a child's developmental stages tell you that there's certain things that might happen at a certain time. And uh, surely a child who is uh, 10 years, for instance, is not supposed to be exposed to sex because that child is likely to get messed up psychologically. Ne? We know these things, eh? Mm -hmm. Look at this ones. <laughs> they they say they know, but they don't want to look at me. So, so so these are the things that are out there. We're concerned about them because we see more and more young people being exposed. The job of the film and publication board is really, in the simplest way I can present to you, is to. We get to see the content before you see it. If you go and watch a movie at Stekineko or New Metro or any independent distributor, that movie would have been seen by the Film and Publication Board. We would have given it a decision, say a, a, an age, indicating this movie is suitable for 16-year-olds, this movie has sex, has violence, has this and this and this. We are advising you. We are advising the parent and the adult who is going to watch the movie and we're also telling that parent or adult that it is not suitable for children. We're also telling the child if you are below this age this movie is not suitable for you. But we know that either way some children watch the movie and some parents allow the children to watch the movie because of whatever reasons that they decide to do so. But I think the most important thing I want to stress is that we don't do that simply because we want to control you and what you are watching. We do that because as children, your development is very important. And the state and society at large has an interest to ensure that it nurtures adults who are balanced as they grow older. So I think that's very important. Uh, the second issue that we deal with a lot is exposure of children to pornography. Because pornography or sexually explicit content is classified as harmful content for children. 
I've explained to you earlier on why a 10-year-old should not be exposed to sex. And if a 10-year-old is being ex exposed to sex, then we must be worried as this society that we're living in that it is happening. So we have a whole system of doing this through classification guidelines and people who are employed to actually classify the films, the games, all the content that we're dealing with. So when you see that classification decision, when you see that movie, we don't classify for TV, but what is important is that we work with the broadcasters. Uh, we're still pushing to work in a much more structured manner with them so that we can have a single classification system for the country. Because what you see in cinema, if you see a movie in cinema being a 16 sex nudity violence, when you see it in, in TV at home two, 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 two months or three months down the line, it should be carrying the same classification decision. It shouldn't be a different classification decision because it's going to co confuse you. If you see it in the internet being streamed on VOD or something, it should be carrying the same uh, classification decision so that we don't confuse each other as a country because of the different institutions that are working on the different streams of our distribution channels, which is television, internet, and films, and other things, other levels of distribution that are being used. So the question that is being asked of how appropriate is the content, I think that um, I, I want to share a bit of my views. Uh, I, I want to clarify, um, Lee, whether I'm participating here as Yoli Somakas or as CEO of FPB, because then the views that I'm going to share, I think I'm going to limit them to them being my views. Uh, I've shared with you what the Film and Pu Publication Board do and why we do that. I just want to tell you that, and in sharing my views, I want to tell you that I have, a, I have two children. I have a six-year-old son and a 16-month-old uh, son. And I take lots of interest in what uh, my six-year-old is watching because he is into cartoons. He watches Cartoon Network and this and this, Ben 10 and all these kind of cartoons. And I've seen, I've seen a particular concern in the content. And this is the content, by the way, we classify at FPB. Because most of those, we classify them even if we don't classify for TV, but what we classify end up on TV. But what I've seen is that some of the values I wouldn't want, some of the things I wouldn't want my son to live, to grow up exposed to, they actually get exposure on TV. Ben 10 would have three girlfriends. Now one girlfriend arrives, the other one is on the way, has called, and now Ben 10 must find a way of running away so that he avoids having a clash of two girlfriends. Now as a mother I would want my child to grow up knowing that if he's committing in a relationship it must be with one person, not with three people. And I would want him to know that uh, I don't want television to teach him uh, how to duck and dive, how to first uh, be able to assemble three women and have three girlfriends, and then how to duck and dive. And this may, this may seem not important in the bigger scheme of things that happen in our world, but if they get exposed as young as that, you know, I had an incident again, uh, there was a program called Stupid Dogs apparently. <laughs> On, on, on TV. So this other day, my son out of the blue is fighting with the helper. But this you are stupid. And I'm like, where did we get that? Where did we get that word? Because we don't use this word in my house. No one is stupid in my house. So I thought, okay, I'm not gonna fight with him now. I'm gonna wait until he cools off whatever he was fighting with Sissy about. So then I asked, baby, where did you get this word stupid? And then he doesn't tell me, he deleted his. After a while, he said, I watch the TV. Stupid Dogs is a part of the program he watches on Cartoon Network. And so I'm like, but do you know, baby, what is a, what, what is, when you say somebody is stupid, what does it mean? He says, yes, mama because Sissy doesn't understand me and Sissy is I'm like we never use that word again in the house so you see the exposure to language and it's things that may not seem really important so I am one of those people who I'm quite concerned to the extent of being paranoid about the content that uh, our children get exposed to in different platforms and I think I agree with Errol that it can't just be the responsibility of the parent alone it has to be responsibility of society Good evening. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the FPB for inviting me here again. 
Um, well, not here again, but here to um, to put forward a point from standing together to oppose pornography. And before I go any further, I want to say that um, there's no way in any way that we are anti-sex or anything like that, you know, because when people think uh, that we stand against pornography, etc., that we are anti-sex. No, we're not. None of us are. You know, we are here to warn and to... Uh, <laughs> none of us... <laughs> next <laughs> so none of us are, yeah are anti-sex you know but sex is a god created thing between a husband and a wife and that's what we are here to promote and i want to just say that today we are here to discuss you know the sexually explicit material or pornography and we must understand as those who are parents or those who are children that today the media has more influence over children than parents, peers or religion and that's a statistical fact. We've got to understand that everything is not about genetics. The environment is just as important as genes is in determining human behavior. The things children experience while growing up are just as important as the things they are born with. An individual's behavior is a product of development and thus there is a causal environmental component. Behaviors copied by children from the environment are likely to be crucial in their development. In other words, what our children are seeing, what they're hearing and what they're looking at is crucial towards their development. Over the recent years, I've been approached by many schools, uh, colleges and similar institutions to address pupils on the topic of pornography and sexually explicit material. More and more, um, the requests have been to come and um, speak to younger and younger kids. Um, what is that? Uh, grade sevens and upwards. Now, I say to myself, do grade sevens want to listen to an old bullet like me? Not really, but there's no one out there carrying the torch, young guys like yourselves, to go and talk and to warn kids about what they're letting themselves in for. You know, experts are telling us that um, when, you, when you're about 25, that is when your brain is fully developed. That's when you can make fully fledged decisions where you can take in all the pros and all the consequences of the decision you're about to make and make that decision. So by, by us teaching kids things which are not relevant for them at that stage of their development, we are damaging those kids. And I won't get too technical, etc., but the frontal lobe of our brain, that's what we call the, the brakes or the conscience, and that's the part of the brain that is only fully developed in your mid-twenties. Now, if you take young kids and you start showing them um, sexually explicit material, they can't conceptualize properly what they're looking at. Sure, they see something, and all kids are inquisitive about sex and pornography. That's a statistical fact. I mean, uh, pornography is, we must remember, to, pornography is developed for men because men were created to be visually stimulated, whereas women are more emotionally stimulated. Mm -hmm. So we've got to understand that um, the effect that's happening to kids when they see sexually explicit material, the, 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 the conscience or your brakes, the frontal lobe, is not fully developed. So the impulses are going straight from the brain into the pleasure centers of the brain and that is obviously you know with the chemicals released the serotonin and dopamine and epinephrine and all those type of chemicals which uh, are released at the time those kids are actually having their brains hot wired to the pleasure centers and we know through um, through uh, research as well as through um, uh, our own local research that often that the damage caused to those kids that have been exposed to sexually explicit material at too young an age, number one, if the kid is very young, they can uh, show the same symptoms as a child that has been sexually abused. And they've only just looked at pornography or something like that. Or um, some of those symptoms can never be reversed. 
even when their brain is fully developed and they're fully functional in society, there can be a certain stimulus of around them which can make them make a totally irrational wrong decision because that part of the brain is still damaged from that early exposure to pornography. That's how dangerous it is, exposing uh, kids to pornography. So I say let us rather err on the side of caution when it comes to protecting our children from the influences of sexually explicit material as well as violence. You know we are talking about sex but sex and violence is a very very strong cocktail and there is so much violence on television as well which is doing exactly the same thing to children we got to understand also you know in violence we're talking about television and on the internet but what about tv games as well all these games uh you know with these burning motor cars and bombing this place etc all of those there are age restrictions on them but are parents watching? Do parents know what their children are playing, etc.? So we have to be more aware. We have to be uh, very discriminate when we look at what our children are having access to. A lot of parents I've spoken to, um, you know, I, I've, I can reel off cases here of absolute uh, frightening uh, consequences of kids accessing pornography. Um, and, and, you know, yeah, we don't see hardcore pornography on the internet, I mean on the television, and we hope never in this country. But that could be like, they say, uh, Dacha is the gateway drug to heavier drugs. Television is the gateway to pornography on the internet and on laptops and devices like this. This is the tool of choice for children today. And we got to understand that children have access to anything by handing them a cell phone. And what we don't realize is that you're a child in this country until your age of 18. Before that, that if you have a cell phone, a parent or a guardian has signed that for that cell phone. So they're the owners of that cell phone. If pornography is found on a child's cell phone, you could be charged with, uh, with neglect or abuse uh, of your own child because you're not looking at what that child has on his cell phone and is as the CEO said if um, they're filming one another or taking pictures of one another that's basically manufacturing child pornography it's a very serious criminal offense let's look at some alarming stats by the time our children reach the age of 18 only 3% of boys and 17% of girls will not have seen hardcore pornography 3% of boys and 17% of girls. And when I talk about hardcore pornography, I'm talking uh, acts that include bestiality, group sex, as well as same sex. The average teen, in a survey done with about 400 uh, teenagers, the average teen between the ages of 14 and 17 watch up to 90 minutes of pornography a week. That's a lot of pornography, okay? Why would very astute businessmen spend millions and millions of rands on advertising products, on television, magazines, movies, etc., if it wasn't affecting our choices? What car we drive, what toilet paper we use, what cigarettes we... Oh, no, they don't advertise cigarettes anymore. What drinks we drink, or whatever it is. You know, it's affecting us. We want to be associated with that. So when you sit and watch pornography on your own, and you say it's not affecting anyone else, it changes the way you think, changes the way you look, even the way you dress. So when you go out, it's changed you, and you taking those effects with you to school, to college, to work. You're looking at people differently. You're thinking about people differently. So yes, it has changed changed us. So be aware of that. I also have to start um, by making a disclaimer um, to uh, your least one in particular. Um, I hardly ever watch TV. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> also, I'm not a child or developmental psychologist, even though I have a background in psychology, so I don't claim to be able to speak authoritatively um, on what we know or do not know about the social psychological impact of violence or sexuality on young people. However, I have been interested in and I have researched and I have engaged in working with young people, thinking about young people and their gender and their sexuality for many years. And so I speak from that perspective. The things I've learned from that research and the things that, that I can draw on to think about this particular question. And I want to start by making the most obvious reflection on 
TV, the media, all forms of media with respect to sexuality, violence, gender and other forms of, of, of social inequality, social identity, social practices. And that is that of course what we see, what is put out there is produced by society. So of course it reflects the dominant messages about what it means to be a human being. And often these are very problematic ideas about it, what it means to be a person, what it means to be a man and woman, what it means to be a person living in our particular societies. So television, for example, frequently presents stereotypes of men and women, which I agree with some of the speakers does in some ways create the conditions for things like gender-based violence, for rape and so on. But it's not only about seeing that happen, it's about the messages about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman, that are implicated in those kinds of practices. So we need to look a lot further than simply um, violence, sexuality and, and those kinds of very obvious representations. So of course I think we have an imperative, it's, it's important for us to think about how we are the part of the problem or part of the solution when it comes to what we show to young people, to in fact everybody in society. Um, in, in my um, presentation today, I'm not going to provi pr provide or present answers, but rather I want to raise some questions, in fact, to call for more critical reflection on our usual, quite knee-jerk, sort of normative responses to what is good or not good for young people to see or hear or read. And in this respect, I want to ask us to consider what drives our concerns on this issue, what are our own ideas, our own values, our own moral positions, that inform the questions that we ask when it comes to thinking about children and young people. And what are our intentions? Are we truly driven by the imperative of ensuring that young people are supported, are looked after, are nurtured, are guided towards appropriate preparation for a democratic, equal and free society? Or are our goals to hold on to a particular vision of what young people should be and should do? I ask this question because I've become increasingly aware of how in my own research on sexuality, and my familiarity with interventions and policy directed towards young people and children, especially in the light of the challenges of HIV and AIDS and unwanted early pregnancy, that much of this work tends to be underpinned by morals, moralistic ideas about young people, what they should do and be, and it tends to be geared towards regulation, discipline, rather than being in their best interests. And I'd like to remind us that the very category of child, of children, the idea of a phase of childhood as distinct from adulthood is relatively new in the history of human beings. There hasn't always been this notion that children need to be protected, need to be looked after. This is something that we have created as human beings. It is something social. Um, it is something, and together with this development, have come an entire range of ideas, of knowledges, of professions that tell us what is right, what's wrong, what is good for children, what may damage children. Um, together, and I'm not trying to say that it's problematic to protect and support and nurture children. I think there are wonderful benefits to what we have created in our societies around children. Um, that it is so wonderful that we have the space and the time to give them, to prepare them um, for the knowledges and skills that will facilitate a better future for them and for our societies as our MC and for our planet in fact. However, there are also a range of prescriptive and moralistic um, messages about what it is to be a child that I think drive our responses to young people. And one of those most enduring beliefs, which I suggest comes to bear on the question posed here today in very problematic ways, is that children are not sexual. And if they are, this must be constrained and kept at bay until they're old enough, in adults' opinions, of when this is to explore their desires and their practices. And I'd like to offer an example from my own research to, to, to um, illustrate how the denial and rejection of young people's sexuality can be very problematic for young people themselves. Um, the MC mentioned the book that I've recently worked on with Robert Moreau and Devere Barner, which is called Books and or Babies, and looks at young people who get pregnant and pay at school. And one of the things that the book shows, what the study shows, is that although young people are protected now, whether they fall pregnant or not, the constitution and a whole barrage of law 
laws and measures supports them to carry on with their schools. In fact, it is very difficult for them to carry on with schooling because their efforts are undermined by the stigma that comes with from not only teachers and principals but also from their own peers who reject them and see them as shameful and believe they should be ashamed. And even the schools see, see it as shame that has been brought upon them because they've got pregnant learners at the school. And so this notion is underpinned by a notion that these young people are children and they should not be sexual. And of course being pregnant is a very clear indication that you have been sexually active. And so what has been what has been rejected is that sexuality. And what we see at the schools is that the minute a young woman starts showing her pregnancy, she must leave. When she comes back with a child, she mustn't show that she's a parent, that she's a mother. She mustn't bring the child to school to breastfeed. So she is she's pushed aside, she's rejected, she is undermined, and even in LO classes, in life orientation classes, which are supposed to be raising these issues and challenging stigma and um, negative prejudicial attitudes and practices, these are the very places where, su where such women often get ostracized and shamed by the teachers. And the notion is that they've fallen, they have, they've fallen out of what is supposed to be correct for young women to do. So to bring this to conclusion, I could have brought a range of studies here today. And there is, is of course, a whole lot of psychological work on the impact of television and other visual media on young people's development. So I could have brought all of that to you to try and give you a definitive answer as to whether displays of sexuality or violence in the media does impact negatively on young people and encourage them to be violent or to have what's seen as premature sexual relations. But I know what you will find if you go to that literature because I have gone to that literature because I have studied it and I have taught it. That research co totally contradicts itself as for every one study that you will find that supports that violence creates aggression, there's another study that undermines that and shows the opposites. And many researchers have also called into questions the very methodologies of studies which have shown this definitive link between TV violence and aggression. Jonathan Friedman, who's a professor of psychology at the University of Toronto and has reviewed this whole body of work on the issue, concludes that either there is no effect of television violence on aggression, or if there is an effect, it is vanishingly small. But of course we do live in a violent society and how we portray violence in the media does matter. It must matter. I do not think that the lack of scientific evidence for the impact of media violence on young people's own aggression means that we should not be extremely thoughtful about what we expose young people to. Rather, I would urge us to think not so much about whether a particular show contains violence or explicit sexuality, but rather how does it portray this? What messages are conveyed? What do young people learn from these representations? So in a society in which masculinity is so powerfully associated with violence and aggression, and in which young men are taught to fight and physical strength is is idealized in, in young men, then a TV show which reinforces that idealization of violence for boys and men is of course questionable. On the other hand, a TV show that presents displays of violence but asks the audience to question this violence, that raises questions about the impact of abuse for the perpetrator and the victim is something different. And we can't judge these two displays of violence in the same way. So I think what I'm calling for is a more thoughtful approach, a more cautious approach, a more nuanced approach. We need to be constantly cautious and reflexive to, to know how to, to respond to, to think about what is presented on the TV and in other visual media. This is hard work and a tall call, for it, it shatters our desire for neat answers or a blanket response. This is all bad. I'd like to argue that in our challenges of transformation of a society that is still so divided by massive and indeed growing inequalities across multiple lines and which violence is endemic um, in our personal relationships and in our communities, we need to take the task of interrogating, asking questions about our society and the messages we're giving out through powerful public media like the television. Very seriously, we need to really take it seriously. We have, however, very newly emerged from centuries of oppression and social regulation of the most brutal sort. We should not forget that. And in our efforts to shape a new society, we should be ever careful not to fall back into the trap of authority, control, and regulation if we are truly committed to an equal, peaceful, and free South Africa. Thank you. Welcome back to the program.
Well, Michelle, that was an interesting debate. Yes, very interesting. Um, I don't know if you, can, you will agree with me, but I think that most of the young people here believe that we do have a problem. Yes. As far as content, be that pornographic or violence is concerned. Mm -hmm. But how to address those problems? The solutions that's a little bit up in the air. Yes, yes. I I actually enjoyed Clive Human's um, talk. He spoke about the percentage. You know, by the age of. 18 boys would have not seen porn is 3% and by the age of 18 girls would have not seen porn I think it's 17% 17%, 17%. That's correct. that was shocking and he said by the age of 25 your brain will only be fully developed at that age so so maybe that gives us a little bit of understanding of what we're seeing in society today yes when you consider that children as young as 8 9 and 10 are sexually molesting other children oh, yes so child and on child sexual abuse is becoming uh, a, a growing issue in South Africa yes. and it's primarily because of the easy access children have to mm. pornography mm. Uh, on the internet primarily because they can download it to their cell phones and what child doesn't have a son cell phone today yes. uh, the hardcore pornography and of course television as well mm. so we, we're sitting with a major problem I don't think in this debate we, we, we got many solutions no. because mm. I don't think it was solution focused but we were talking about um, uh, the problem yes. and I think the key thing is that overwhelmingly people uh, do recognize we have, have a problem um, and my, my answer to that um, in the program was that it all stems back to the family. Yes, and I training think up. You know, the Bible says, train up a child in the way it should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. And I think they came across a lot about imp imparting. You were mentioning imparting That's right. models, inf not enforcing, but upholding those model those standards because a lot of model standards have failed within family and I think we even as, as a church as the body of Christ and other institutions we can help in assisting upholding those values uh, that's correct because you know when, fa when the family breaks down the, the model system the, uh, in that family breaks down as yes. well so th there's no mom and dad that can demonstrate or um, uh, illustrate what a, a family looks like or mm -hmm. what a good marriage looks like mm -hmm. and so kids grow up in a dysfunctional family yeah. they don't know how to uh, look after their marriages yeah. because they haven't been taught by the demonstration of their parents and then of course uh, the father figure being uh, um, uh, not not being present in the mm -hmm. home that is a biggie in yes, South Africa definitely especially for young boys when yeah. there's no authority figure in the home boys of course get involved in all kinds of things yeah. and uh, access pornography is a key thing here because there's no father to teach them. Yeah. Yolisa Wamakazi, the CEO of the Film and Publication mm -hmm. Board, made the point of education, education, education. Yes. But the point is, who educates? Yeah. I think we should have programs, you know, definitely programs. Um, I like, I want to echo on the point that you said absent fathers, and we've seen it in our church. And what we do is with the single parents, we have some of the men in the church, um, you know, helping the boys, helping the girls, and yeah, act as that's a, a great father, idea. which is awesome. It works because sometimes a single mom doesn't have that authority. You know, sometimes kids don't listen to the mom, they prefer a male figure, so they respond to that so that's a, another point we can have people in in our churches in society helping the single parents helping the single mom putting those rules putting those moral values within the home yeah I, I agree with that the church there's a lot the church uh, can do yes. to and especially uh, single parent families where men in the church uh, can take those young boys under yes. their wing, mm -hmm. uh, can be the father figure in their lives mm. and help teach them the values that they're not getting at, uh, at home. Yes. So there's a lot the church can do. There's a lot that society can do that we're not doing. Yeah. But I mean, it still come back to the key issue is, is what on television appropriate for children? Mm. And I think resoundingly um, what came out tonight was that it is not. No, it is not appropriate. Not. They even spoke about the soapies. Uh, and many of the older people said when they were kids, yeah. uh, they, they, their parents wouldn't allow them to watch these kind of programs. True. And there was a reason for that. Yes. Today, most kids watch whatever they yeah. want on television, yeah. and it is a hundred times worse than it was, say, 10 or 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So you can see the challenge that we faced with. Yes. But the enforcement of values, that is a great issue that the young man yeah. raised there. And I said, you can't enforce values. You can't uh, force 
uh, your values on people. Mm -hmm. You can only teach them. You can demonstrate that. And people say, look, I like that family. I like what goes on there. I like the way that man or that woman conducts themselves. Yes, yes. And they want to follow that example. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said we need more good examples, yeah, more godly also, examples yeah, in society. Yeah, we also find that the roles have shifted. You know, the child becomes the parent now and vice versa. Yeah, and one that's of the people the said that. Yeah, that's why the child gets to say what I want to watch, demands a cell phone, demands internet access, and it's time that the parent put their foot down. Yeah, you know, discipline I, I believe within that. the home because the, peer, the child cannot rule. Moms I, and dads put your foot down. Yeah, they, I often say that uh, there are more dysfunctional parents today <laughs> than there are dysfunctional children. And that is a fact. Yeah. Uh, because parents, uh, children uh, follow uh, um, and em emulate their parents. Mm -hmm. And if parents are, are not behaving as parents and not, are not being responsible people, yes. kids see that and they follow that example. Yes. And, and I made the point that you can teach children, you can tell them, don't do this and do that but what children do is they follow your example yes. they do what you do yes. not what you say yes. so this was a great discussion a great debate tonight Definitely. we're glad to be part of it mm -hmm. and uh, we're going to have more of these kind of uh, uh, debates and programs in in future months and weeks uh, and uh, but we'll advertise that so if you want to uh, make a comment uh, on any of our programs please email us at info at familypolicyinstitute.com. You can also join us on Facebook. Uh, our Facebook page is Family Policy Institute. Uh, the, the group, not the page, join us and you can join the debate. Uh, remember to keep on praying, especially into issues like this, where children are being exposed to all kinds of harmful content on the television, on the internet. Pray into that. Keep standing and God bless you.